I'd like to tell you about this uh, course where I think um, gamification uh, has a particularly important role in teaching the subject matter. Uh, and uh, thank you all for being here. Let's see if I can get this to advance. Uh, I'll try to keep this within the time limit. I want to tell you about the educational context for the course, the gamification context, uh, something about what the students do, and then an explanation for how the gamification fits into this uh, classical theory of problem solving, and then some uh, reflections and outcomes. I thought I'd show you uh, the graphic that I have on the homepage for the course. It uh, tries to put several different uh, components together here, the gamification, uh, sort of playful attitude, but towards some actually very difficult problems, the so-called wicked problems. Um, and uh, let me now tell you a little bit about the context for this course. There is a special program at the University of Washington here for incoming freshman students. These are brand new college students who are getting a head start on their college experience by coming about a month early to the campus. And they, uh, they take a course, which is an intensive four-week course. And it's great for the instructors because these students don't do anything else during this time except uh, take this course and do a lot of work. And uh, it's, it's uh, possible to design a course that isn't constrained by, uh, by all of the curriculum committees and so forth that are trying to uh, shape uh, uh, very traditional things. So interdisciplinary courses fit very well into this program. Um, we're not allowed to have uh, prerequisites for the students, but I do encourage them to come in with computer programming experience. And sometimes, uh, usually we get about 20% who don't have any computer background or computer programming background. And this is, uh, this is a feature, but also a limitation of the course. Uh, perhaps the students' games would be much more sophisticated if everyone knew how to program before they came. But uh, uh, my personal goal for this whole, it, it, whole sort of course design and so forth is to try to help build a culture of problem solving where we can take advantage of what we understand about problem solving and uh, principles from artificial intelligence, psychology, and so forth to maybe help the next generation uh, better approach uh, dealing with the big challenges ahead. Um, in terms of the gamification context, um, we have gamification at three levels in this course. And this, uh, I didn't know it before I began this project and wrote the paper and got feedback from reviewers, but uh, others have been working in this field. Uh, for example, uh, Charlotte Lerke Weitz's Smiley model uh, incorporates very similar levels of, of gamification where students are playing games in some, in some way. Uh, they're building games. Uh, and then there's so, sort of this big game uh, aspect to the entire course where uh, the way the course is run uh, has a set of rules or uh, or there's some metaphor associated with it um, in terms of gamification. So it's very similar here. And then there's the octalysis model and the work of, uh, of an, another one of our authors, uh, Ava Morrill Olson. Uh, so I'm very uh, uh, thankful to these authors who have done this, this work in the past to help me see how this uh, my particular course fits into the overall gamification. So uh, the key idea for me is that uh, games are really important as a means for students to get a handle on so-called wicked problems, very difficult, challenging problems that uh, many people have no idea where to begin thinking about these you know, challenges like climate change and uh, managing COVID-19 and so forth, but through gamification, uh, people can begin to take, in some sense, take possession, take control of these problems and develop mental models that help them um, explain it, understand it, and so forth. Um, here, here's an overview of the course in terms of the four weeks. During the first week, uh, we do a lot of mechanical things, including uh, 
covering Python, the programming uh, language Python. And I have students playing serious games at what I call tier A, the first level where uh, students are learning by playing these games. And I'll tell you a bit more about that a bit later. Um, they begin formulating problems and understanding the classical theory of problem solving in the second week. And then the second half of the course, weeks three and four, is where the students are really building their own games and they're also role playing. That's tier C of the gamification. So here's a bit more detail on the four weeks. Uh, we meet four times a week, two and a half hours per class. So uh, 10 hours a week of class time and about uh, supposedly 30 hours of time outside of class each week. Um, and so it's uh, about 16 meetings over a four week period. Um, what I try to explain to the students, because I do advertise this as a course on game design, some of them come in with the idea that they're going to be building first person shooter games or something because so much of computer technology and gaming is about entertainment. But I tell them, no, that's not the kind of game that they're actually going to be designing. Uh, and, and so we talk about what games, what the space of games is. So uh, the course in a nutshell is they're learning to analyze problems and formulating them as games, and then to do it with Python code. So they end up with uh, something that is operational. So here's the way I kind of break down games so they can understand the kind of games that they'll be building. Here's the space of all games that you can imagine. Some are computer games, some are non-computer games, basically. All right, that's one way of talking about this. So non-computer games include board games, card games, sports, other games. Um, the computer games, including the uh, include the popular first-person shooter games, various kinds of online puzzle games or on your phone puzzle games, simulations, and other. Another way of partitioning the space of games that's orthogonal to those technical aspects or how they're implemented is what the purpose is. So if they're mainly for entertainment, that's one category. But then there are these so-called serious games, and that's where I want my students to be focusing their attention. So uh, we can further divide those serious games into those dealing with basic education and training versus say exploring and understanding for problem solving. Uh, perhaps it's a slightly artificial distinction, but I wanna tell students here in this small part of this overall space of games is where you're going to be really focusing your attention, exploring and understanding for solving wicked problems. And in particular, these uh, we're going to go into, into an even smaller subset of that because they're gonna be using particular tools and approaches, um, including coding and Python. So I call these TK solution games uh, just because uh, we're using a particular framework of tools for this that, uh, that uh, have been developed here. So these are the three tiers, uh, learning by playing mostly serious games. Uh, tier B, formulating wicked problems as games using the classical theory of problem solving. I'll tell you a bit more about that. And, and then tier C is the role playing in agile development teams. And each of these tiers has its benefits. They, they seem to complement each other nicely. At tier A, these are the kinds of games that I have students play. Uh, for the first few years that this course was offered, and it's been offered about six years now, uh, I would have the students play BBC Climate Challenge because it's uh, it just has a lot of nice elements uh, to, to create sort of a, a landmark in a student's mind about a particular serious game. Unfortunately, it was implemented in Flash. Browsers now don't support Flash, and it's difficult to assign that to students. Uh, although I did create an hour-long play playthrough uh, video that uh, students have the option of watching in lieu of playing themselves. Um, here's some other games, Climate Quest, Spent, and Ice Flows. Um, and uh, those are some of the games the students play at Tier A. Um, I want to talk a bit about this relationship between the classical theory of problem solving and gamification. 
The first question here is, what is a problem? So it's a need, a desire, a requirement to go from some starting situation or initial state via some unknown sequence of operations to some goal, some sort of target, uh, could be design of a system or trying to get out of a maze or whatever it is. The next question is, what's a wicked problem? And I'm not going to go into all the details here, but it's a problem that has a number of characteristics, such as those cited by Riddle and Weber, that make this problem particularly challenging. For example, it could be uh, there could be great disagreement in society about how to formulate that problem. And the third question here is, what's the classic theory of problem solving? It's a formal model for expressing problems, um, and it can serve as a rigorous basis for gamification and in-depth understanding of problems. Here, just now back to the definition of a problem. Let me give three examples, map coloring, maze solving, and water jokes. So here's a map of the particular state in the US where I live, Washington state, has got a bunch of counties. The, the problem is to color each county with uh, some color such that if two states share a common border, they don't get the same color, and then you're trying to minimize the number of colors. For example, four colors or three colors, here's a solution. So that's a problem, and there are various ways of uh, expressing that and so forth. Here's another one. So uh, here are a couple of children in a maze. This is a corn maze, all right? And they have to get out. Uh, so the problem is to find a path from wherever they are, or perhaps it's from a special starting point, and then getting out of the maze. And so the problem is to come up with that, that path. And here's a third problem. This one is uh, an example of a water jug problem where you've got two water jugs, a three liter and a five liter container, uh, and you have to somehow come out, up with a specific amount of water, four liters, which is not the, the volumes of either of the two, through some sequence of operations. What's a wicked problem? Here are a couple of examples. You know, providing fresh water to everyone on earth. It's uh, perhaps impossible, but uh, you know, there are different, different ways of, of approaching things like that. Uh, managing COVID-19, another very challenging problem, opposing stakeholders, all kinds of things. What's the classical theory of problem solving? It's this formal model and it really based on work by a bunch of researchers in the 50s and 60s, but it's uh, well described by uh, Newell and Simon in their book, Human Problem Solving, that came out in 1972. It says that a problem can be modeled by specifying three components, an initial state where you're starting the situation that you're trying to uh, you know, uh, begin in and then uh, get, you're trying to get to a goal state. And you have a set of operators that transform states that take you one step at a time. And that's, that's the representation of a problem. And here's a sort of a, a little bit more abstract view, but it's clear here that you have an initial state. It's written here with some symbol, uh, sigma zero. And you apply these operators and you try to get to a goal state. There might be several possible goals. Um, but with this theory, the students will be able to uh, have a very clear approach to how they have to formulate their, their problems. Just to show how this applies to one of those three problems I mentioned earlier, for the water jug problem, the representation of the initial state is zero liters of water in the small jug, zero in the larger jug. So you have zero, zero as the representation of the initial state. And then you have a set of operators, like filling one of the containers from the tap, uh, or filling one from the other as far as it can go without spilling, or emptying one of these containers down the drain. And then a solution to this problem is a sequence of these operators that starts at the initial state, and ends at the goal state, and every step is applying one of these operators. At the end, you have three liters in the small container and four liters instead of five liters in the uh, larger container, and so you've solved the problem. At tier B, students can, can create games, and they do it through this process. They brainstorm at first, select a wicked problem. We do this as a class. Then they, uh, then they have to gather materials. They can find them on the internet. 
uh, they can find them in the library, whatever it is, uh, they have to analyze these resources and we call this phase pre-formulation. Then they have to pose their problem. And this is basically the, the key to the game design here. Uh, they're modeling the problem, determining the starting situation, the goal and the various operations that players can, uh, can perform. Then they're coding the game in the so-called coding phase and they're creating workable Python code uh, using a lot of you know, support software that we give them. And, uh, and then they're also, also uh, doing iterative design, they're debugging, they're presenting, they're doing peer evaluations and, uh, and responding. Here's just an example of a visualization that was done by uh, a group of students in their game, uh, which is they called the world of water, which is about saving, uh, saving the world from drought and so forth. Um, tier C is about students doing role playing in agile development teams. This idea of agile development fits very well, this whole business of gamification of wicked problems because it's about uh, creating software under conditions where the specifications are changing. Uh, so as students decide what they can do and what they can't do, they have to keep sort of revising their plans for the software. And this just fits very well into the so-called so agile, you know, scrum development approaches. So uh, it was necessary to sort of adapt this agile methodology to the classroom situation because, for example, um, the industrial uh, agile development uh, model involves a project owner who is the ultimate sort of authority on what happens uh, and tells the, the, you know, the, the team developing, oh, I don't like that, you have to do this or you don't get paid, something like that. Um, we don't have an, a, a single person or company that's an owner of the problems that the students are uh, are doing. So uh, we have a, a plan where the entire class becomes the project owner and has the ultimate say over what the students are supposed to be doing. Um, and that works well because every student becomes responsible as a member of the class, not only for the for the game they're developing themselves, but for all the other games. And so um, th that's like the big uh, game that, uh, that uh, Weitza has, has pioneered in her work. Just, uh, just an example of how the peer evaluation information flow <laughs> goes in the course. We have in each team a, a special role that was not part of the industrial uh, model of agile development called the Scrum Ambassador, which serves as a representative of each group to the rest of the class. And uh, that turns out to be a very practical way of managing all of these groups, because when I ask uh, a group for something, it's the Scrum Ambassador who was, is responsible to uh, respond and, and carry out the communication. Um, as opposed to say the scrum master sounds like a boss, but it's not a boss according to scrum method, uh, methodology. The scrum master is simply responsible for having each team follow scrum and agile protocols and to adhere to the process. It's not to tell anyone specifically what to do. Um, outcomes and reflections, and uh, thank you to the reviewer who, who asked, well, what did the students learn in the course? Um, I do ask each class in their reports to uh, to tell me what they learned. Um, so each team has to mention uh, some things. And uh, I went through the uh, all the reports that I had and counted the occurrences of various topics that students said that they they learned. And uh, some of the most, well, it turns out that collaboration <laughs> Uh, was the number one thing that students said they learned. So the logistics of being in a team and producing something in the, in about two weeks uh, forced them to to learn how to collaborate with others. Um, software engineering, Python, specific wicked problems, what wicked problems are, how to formulate problems, graphic user interface development, game structure and game design, communication. Uh, Scrum methodology, uh, Git 
usage, uh, solution, game software framework, social and cultural lessons, problem solving theory. These are the things that students say they learned uh, in the course. I'm uh, probably not supposed to show pictures of people, but uh, this was our most recent class this past summer um, at the University of Washington. Um, some limitations besides this uh, fact that the early fall start program limits enrollment to 25 students per course. Um, if, if we were to try to export this course to other places, we have to find an instructor who's familiar with the technology, the classical theory, and some of these wicked problems. That's one limitation. Uh, the students need to be comfortable with computer programming, either already know it or be ready to learn it. Um, students have to spend a lot of time, at least on this course, and I mentioned that it's it's about 160 hours over this four week period. Um, I'm the only one who's taught the course so far, I, although I'd, it would be really cool to see uh, someone else interested in uh, trying to, to offer this course elsewhere. Uh, the software is custom built for the course in Python and, uh, and the GUI development uh, library TK Inter. Um, and I would say uh, a lot more research needs to be done on the various aspects of the course and possible alternatives to some of the design decisions that, uh, that, that I ended up having to, to make. Uh, so thank you uh, to all of you in the audience and thank you to the anonymous reviewers, special issue organizers, editor and staff of, uh, of the journal. Uh, feel free to read the paper and contact me if you have any questions uh, and Happy New Year. Thank you, Steve, for a great presentation. I'm pretty sure that most of us already started thinking how I will start my next class with some crazy play. At least I started with uh, Teleprocess Robot Slalom already. <laughs> So we definitely should uh, use more uh, game approach, but please, from audience, we have time to take one question. I have a couple of comments uh, on the, <clears throat> the definition of two terms. Maybe then the uh, Stephen can uh, uh, can add something more about. Um, the first one is about a wicked problem. Okay, and. Uh, uh, I have the impression that some of the problems that you show are well defined in some sense, because they usually we get problem problem are a problem that are incomplete, uh, contradictory, and often a, a very difficult in some way to recognize all the elements that make part of the problem, and uh, usually they have not a single solution. And for for example, a design problem is a wicked problem. So uh, as a not uh, a, a, a just one solution, but just the, the best solution, the optimal solution that you can propose uh, with respect to the definition, the level of definition of the problem that you have uh, achieved. So uh, this is uh, about wicked problem. And the other comment is about uh, gamification. That uh, usually uh, uh, gamification is the introduction, the introduction of some uh, gaming elements in uh, in uh, uh, a process. It's not uh, uh, just gaming. So I mean, uh, it's interesting in, uh, uh, to understand in which sense you use uh, the term uh, gamification. All right. Uh, let me speak first to the wicked problem uh, question. Um, so the, the Riddle and Weber criteria uh, are pretty ambiguous, you know, when you read them, at least from a computer scientist's point of view. Um, uh, the, the planners developed these criteria, I think, in order to push back against the, the, the Herb Simon uh, science of design uh, ideas that, that every government policy can be formulated as, as some sort of... Uh, you know, problem that could be solved through a mechanical process. Um, so what I have my students do is try to defend whatever problem they, they end up uh, proposing as their problem uh, by uh, articulating the ways in which it's wicked. And we the, the Riddle and Weber criteria are, are 10 
different points, uh, things like there's no uh, definitive set of operations that's applicable to solving the problem or, uh, and we also add in a, a separate, I, I have the uh, students also think about uh, whether there are opposing stakeholders that have different objectives, you know, for example, with uh, oil and uh, versus environmental concerns, the oil industry doesn't want uh, uh, restrictions on what they can do, but the environmental movement uh, does, and so there's a there's a conflict of stakeholders. So uh, a wicked problem then is something that has all these elements. But I also encourage the students to take problems that are, in some sense, global that affect almost everyone in the world. Uh, and so the wickedness, as you say. Uh, uh, is a, there's a little bit of wickedness in any design problem in that there are al alternative solutions and uh, the exact way in which you measure or, or evaluate them may depend on your, your point of view and so forth. Um, let's switch over to your second problem about gamification. Uh, in, in a way, the classical theory of problem solving is itself a sort of definition of a form of gamification. Uh, so by bringing in by bringing in operators explicitly uh, into your model of, of, of the game or what the what a game is, that's you know that takes the form of various uh, game mechanics, turn turn taking, for example. So when uh, in a turn, you're going to apply one operator from the th classical theory. So um, I, I agree that there are many ways of gamifying something by just bringing in game mechanics. But uh, by using the classical theory, you sort of get one particular set of game mechanics. What you call them and you know how they look on the screen uh, is less important than the structure of the gamification that comes from the, the classical theory. You know, um, you know how you actually apply an operator affects how the player's experience unfolds, but the actual structure of the game is just you're taking steps from the initial state towards the final state of the game, and so uh, and so it's an abstraction in some sense of particular game mechanics. Um, uh, now, when I talk about the three levels of gamification, I guess I'm using gamification there in a more general sense, because, uh, for example, at the level of tier C, the role playing, uh, I'm not claiming that, that that also fits into the classical theory. The students aren't trying to, aren't trying to win a game uh, as they role play, but we typically call role playing a, a form of, you know, a type of gamification. Thank you.